www.mindfulnessstrategies.com. I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Ellen Kumar. Ms. Kumar is a solution architect with GP Strategies and has several roles, has served several roles ranging from account executive to operations director, project manager, and training consultant. Prior to GP Strategies, she worked for the University of Dayton's Research Institute and GE Aviation. She holds an MS in Material Science and Engineering from the University of Dayton. So Ellen, um, I worked with, I should say this, I've worked with Ellen for a number of years and I, I can say that you are all in very qualified hands. This is the first webinar um, I've done with her, so welcome Ellen. And uh, without further ado, I will turn things over to you. Great, thank you Kayla. Um, and welcome everyone who has um, decided to join us today. Um, my goal for the webinar are on the next slide, as I'm going to advance to. And I hope that after the session today, you'll be better able to define digital transformation, describe your multi-generational workplace and their needs, show the benefits of a more fluid organization, and finally, prioritize your own digital transformation plan and timeline. We're going to start with some key concepts first. Um, so I, I looked and I've reviewed and have found many different definitions and descriptions in the literature about what is digital transformation. And my favorite seems to be that it's not just the convergence, but the conversion of business activities, processes, competencies, and models to fully leverage the changes in and opportunities of digital technologies. Kind of a mouthful, but I think we're going to try to make that real for you. You know, does that mean digitally transformed finance, um, a new HR organization, a digitally transformed customer service, supply chain, manufacturing? It could be any part of your enterprise or multiple parts eventually all linked together and integrated. Most organizations, when they're surveyed, say that they're evaluating a digital solution to enable benefits, which might be a richer customer experience, reduced waste, speeded up processes, or improved bottom line if you're a for-profit enterprise. As a change or learning leader, do you need convincing that you should start play, that you should be starting to plan your own organization's digital transformation? I think not. So let's get started. The next key concept is smart data. Big data is all around us. People are wearing it, people are driving it, the appliances in our house, and the devices are, are getting you know, more and more adept at telling us when and what things you know, need to be changed. So consider these number of devices you use and interact with in your personal life. They're, the devices and sensors are generating data at such a rate we might never have predicted in the past. How do we transform this big data into smart data, meaning that so that it's accessible and able to be presented for consumption and ultimately used to secure a competitive advantage? Your answer is to enable your frontline workers with smart data analysis skills so they may create compelling business cases for leadership and their colleagues to act on in real time. So we can either be intrigued or kind of irate as the world around us changes, right in front of us, uh, depending on our perspective. Um, you may love the idea of self-driving cars someday, or you may say, you know, how did we, how did we get here and how do I <laughs> work around it? Um, the fact that cars are being now developed by startups and going to head, head to head with, you know, the, the, the automotive and transit companies that have been around for generations is kind of amazing. We might not need or want to purchase a car in the future, but just might want to schedule a ride on demand. So you can see the benefits along with the, the massive changes, certainly. Likewise, in the publishing industry, the fact that we can put digital pictures and stories online so quickly and easily has forced news agencies to radically shift the way they work or risk extinction. And our experience in a doctor's office is now very different than it was maybe even just two years ago. Um, we might not be going to the office to be diagnosed or treated, but we could be talking to our doctors virtually rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, so those interactions require different soft skills than both our doctors and ourselves as consumers 
um, have grown up with and grown accustomed to. Another key concept is the impact on frontline workers of cloud solutions. Your business leaders are selecting new cloud-based solutions to simplify business processes. And while that promises that simpler processes will be more intuitive and thus demand less of a need for performance support, the reality is that with cloud, there is no monumental go live that you need to prepare for, build up to, and then recover from. Cloud, in fact, then is going to mean more frequent but incremental changes in new releases. And so us, um, you know, on our side as change and learning leaders, we need to polish our skills and add more innovative means to alert people to what the changes in the next release mean for them. This might mean that, you know, we enlist the help of super users to be on the forefront previewing new releases, anticipating what the impacts of changes will be, um, et cetera. How do we get in front of that curve, kind of quantify the deltas, and, and then move from there to better equip the workforce? So we're going to go into a couple of poll questions on the next two slides. And the first one is now presented for you. Let's take a moment to um, read the question together, and then I'd like you to start responding. Um, quite simply, we'd like to know why you're attending today's seminar. And we've got three or four choices here. Um, Kayla's going to leave the poll open for about a minute while she collects your responses. And this will help me understand and possibly tailor my discussion a bit. Yep, so the poll should be open now. I see people are inputting their answers. We're going to give it about, oh, 30 more seconds, and then we'll go ahead and close it out and share the results. I've been to a number of conferences in the past six months, and we Generally, speakers want to know, where are you on this, this timeline? Are you, um, has it, have you already gone digital? Are you still in the planning phases? Are you supporting a customer that's going digital where you're not the major, you know, the major impacted audience yourself, et cetera? So it's looking like we've got the results out here. And the highest is other. So since we don't have comments, perhaps we can um, capture those at the end of the um, the end of the session in the Q and A if there is time for discussion. But it looks yeah, like and, and Alan yeah, too. If folks want to the the chat isn't public facing, but if you certainly want to chat Ellen or myself, um, you know what your other is, we'd love to hear it. Go ahead and put it in the chat field, and then I will make sure that um, Ellen sees those results at the end of the session. Great, thank you. Um, the 10% the saying that they've already gone digital is very consistent with what I have been hearing from audiences in seminars that I've participated in. So that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually not an overnight process. Um, so the, fa the early adopters are the ones that have <clears throat> made the decision, made the plans, and gone through the deployment. Um, but you're on the forefront. The rest of um, the folks in the line appear to be either supporting customers or in the planning stages right now, but not yet live digital, digitally. Okay, thank you so much for participating in that poll. Our second question is, what is on your worry meter? It's a variation on the what keeps you up at night question, um, and I'd like to know just where your comfort level is as you look forward into the, the, the digital future for your company or your customers. Thanks, Ellen, and that poll is now open. You've got about 45 seconds. If folks can go ahead and put their answers in, I do see them coming in now. Um, so we'll, we'll just give you about 30 more seconds and then close that poll out and share the results. Yeah, it seems like there's, there's so many things to prioritize. It's just uh, what do you think mm -hmm. is going to be the big sleep for you? All right, we'll go ahead and close it out and share the results here in just a few seconds. All right. 
Okay. So the biggest number of people, over a third of you, um, are concerned about the willingness of users to adapt digitally transformed processes and tasks, while the other three are all hovering around between 15 and 20 percent around communications, um, multi-generational needs, and budget. Okay, thank you again, audience, and we will proceed with the session. So when I started hearing a lot about Agile um, several years ago, it was in relation to software development. And then it became more and more a project approach for the last couple of years and things that we were being asked by customers to consider. You know, we are an Agile culture. We're, we're implementing this Agilely. How will you, GP Strategies, adapt to that? So one thing I would say is that with traditional change management, um, you, we may need to adapt to the Agile wor world and the Agile projects that we're supporting by thinking of them less as multi-month projects and more we think of our role now as communicators and design, you know, we, we need to increase awareness about upcoming changes. We need to enable our digitally transforming enterprises to be more agile themselves in preparing for and adapting to frequent workplace changes. And a question we may need to ask is, will our efforts, will our digital transformation initiatives require changes just to methods, systems, and behaviors? Or will they also require changes to mindset? This is a, um, an important distinction that we're going to be talking about more during the session. So agile change management is defined as integrated practices and processes that manage evolving requirements and workforce needs and preferences. It's all a very dynamic versus a static state. Um, if we can get to this, this state, though, um, research has shown uh, that agile organizations will grow revenue faster and generate profits more quickly than those who don't um, become agile. So instilling the concept that multiple levels is an approach to consider. It should result in a healthier attitude towards embracing change. I will close this out by saying, you know, digital solutions mean live information and insight, and ideally that's so employees may continuously identify improvements, i.e., in how their customer needs are being met, et cetera. Come up with ideas. So the more agile we can become, the better we'll able, we're equipping our folks to behave and change their mindset in a digital world. So, Going along that line, um, a few new terms that I wanted to introduce are commitment and enrollment. As we prepare for a digital transformation, you as change and learning leaders will require commitment from all levels in your organization, from stakeholders and sponsors, down to project leadership, super users, and end users. Commitment at all these levels is marked when associates say they are willing to try and change not only their behavior but also their mindset, there's that word again, so that even when it feels uncomfortable or challenging, they'll still make the effort. It's not going to be easy and they must agree to participate perhaps in sessions like focus groups, coaching, training workshop, designed to support those changes in happening. Um, and that's the enrollment part. Um, not just getting their agreement to attend training, but enrolling in the change, agreeing that things will be hard, that they will work through it with the help of their coaches, their peers, their managers, et cetera. And finally, we need to put in, pla in place ways to measure when those changes to mindset have been achieved. So in addition, to, think, you know, enrolling people, getting their commitment, I think you need to be prepared that there may need to be mitigation put in place if people, if everyone, cannot make the leap right away and sometimes maybe if ever. Um, you need, it's, it's quite possible. And you and your human capital management team should be enlisted to conduct surveys early so that you can predict gaps uh, make recommendations on job or role or organization redesign, 
along with implementing the types of coaching that will be required in order to accommodate these shortfalls without negatively impacting productivity. You need to ask, what impact is this going to have on the organization, and then seek ways to address it. I'll give you an example. Frontline workers in a digitally transformed workplace may need to interact with others whom they've never dealt with directly before. Um, and so that can be kind of daunting, especially if the people are senior to them or from parts of the organization that don't, you know, that are, that are very different. So you may consider an approach that combines coaching and role-playing games that workers participate in and then discuss. Um, both live games, online games could be designed, depending on the generations in your workplace, to encourage participants to practice new mindsets and then earn rewards, recognition, but all doing so in a risk-free environment. And I would say you should focus on job outcomes. Create a vision for people so that they can see how their behavior and mindset contributes to the organization's success. If it's relevant for them, this will increase their engagement, increase their motivation, and ideally um, underline and underscore a successful adoption effort. I would say also that having access to better information on digitally transformed platforms may dictate that folks like middle managers should now need to share information in order to aid um, the whole organization with more rapid decision making. Um, collaboration can aid in creativity, it can produce better ideas and yield better results. So consider the use of collaboration sites. Um, establish communities of practice so that managers may query one another as well as super users for best practices as well as fails um, so you know what to avoid in the future. Post lessons learned and in the process raise the, a collective level of their digital literacy. So as you look across your enterprise, um, many, cu um, many customers of ours are saying, we, we see at least three generations out there, um, long-term baby boomers, uh, the Gen Xers, as well as the youngest workers, the millennials. Um, many baby boomers have committed work routines to memory, and thus the fact, the thought of their work environment being turned on its head is making them a little uneasy. Gen Xers may be more comfortable with this whole idea of changing roles and processes since their working years have been marked by um, really revolutionary technology, technological advances, but they still need time to process what the change will mean for them. Not only what the change can bring to them, but how they can impact it. How do their actions contribute to the success of the whole? That's what they want to know. Millennials are not only used to a rapid pace of change, they expect that each change wave will bring improvements, just like the latest iPhone will bring improvements. You know, if it's going to, if there's a new release coming out, what's it mean for me? It's going to be better, right? I hope so. That's what the millennials will be asking. Mm -hmm. So streamlining their processes is, and making their, their, their lives easier, that's what they, they are hoping to achieve if, if they're in your workforce. So in the following slides, we'll address some rules of thumb for generational learning preferences. For baby boomers, um, as a learning leader, you've got to make decisions about how to spend your content design and development dollars when you're designing training. It can be, it would be prohibitively expensive to deploy and maintain separate learning solutions on every new topic for every generation in your, in your environment. Instead, um, we're going to give you some ideas here, and I would say as a general rule, Build in instructor notes and learning notes to present options for how to use materials depending on the audience. Um, if your solution ideally blends in elements that appeal to different um, generational preferences, bingo. It should be a winner. Um, so survey early, survey often. Um, group activities, such as role play, followed by time to practice new skills on their own, should appeal to most baby boomers since they enjoy the interaction but prefer to receive constructive criticism one-on-one. -on -one. So make sure that group activities are designed to be realistic, bring in those, those relevant job outcome stories um, that I talked about before, yet make them fun and low enough intensity that they will be inclusive to all workers. Long-time workers 
want to be equipped to perform as per their expectations. So um, we design, if we design the activities to focus on job outcomes, this should help baby boomers enroll in the change. Gen Xers appreciate relevance and will want options to explore tasks their way whenever possible. They may not be really into reading job aids and following your step-by-step -step approaches. They want to see what's the quickest and most efficient way. Can I figure it out on my own? So expect that and um, design activities to encourage that, in fact, encourage discovery and exploration. And then once they've found ways, they should be primary contributors to the best practices boards on collaboration sites, kind of leading the way so that others can benefit from their discoveries. For millennials, um, I would challenge your learning and design team to do, um, develop group work to be technology enabled, have social components, yet still be individually eval evaluated since this is the millennials' normal way of working. Chances are you're already designing learning solutions that must appeal to and be effective for multiple generations. Survey your learners, seek their input early, and the goal is that your investment um, to adapt content to multiple generations will be recouped when you gain skills, when you can measure the gains in the, um, your learners' skills, their productivity, and their digital literacy. Now we're gonna to transition topics a bit and talk about organizational fluidity. As enterprises mature on their digital transformation journey, they evolve from structured hierarchies to agile teams. And this necessitates a move from traditional change management to an approach that stands ready to face conflict and failure, which are both acceptable and inevitable. Gartner's research in 2014 evolved, uh, defined this evolved OCM approach as organizational fluidity. And organ uh, change leaders, in, or, in fluid organizations must establish an agile culture. In addition to establishing an agile culture, and they should be allocating time for reshaping goals for the business as it matures. And remember, it's not static, it's gonna change. We need to be kind of on the forefront of, of resetting those goals and those targets. Leaders may also want to set aside time for teams to practice operating more effectively together in order to drive success, right? Newly integrated teams will experience smoother handoffs when their roles are well-defined and when they're able to anticipate rough patches. Anticipation doesn't necessarily result in elimination of difficult results, but rather people will know better how to work through them with minimal repercussions. Finally, think of what is learned from experiencing challenges in the workplace. Change leaders should plan for and facilitate forums where teams can talk about their failures then share and document them. Document the best practices. Document the failures and the best practices. It's important to see both sides of the coin. Recall that digitally transformed solutions mean live data and insight. So the organization must teach, coach, provide ways for employees to share those insights through collaboration and knowledge sharing. Speaking of sharing, I think um, it's important to say that a digital transformation demands will we'll be communicating differently within our teams as well as up, down, and across the organization. If we're vague or hesitant, our intent won't be conveyed, and so decision-making may be negatively impacted. I think the soft skills of communication will be more and more important than they ever have been in the past. People won't just be sitting in front of you know, screens and kind of communicating through email. The emails will need to be clear. Is, you know, there, today we, we, we've become somewhat sloppy, um, but I think uh, the ability for us to look at data and need to share it, make recommendations, um, let others know what we're seeing is just going to be tantamount to our success as organizations. So this will be an ongoing process. Change leaders and digitally transforma transforming organizations must coach each role on their relationship to others and then define and have them practice types of clear communication which are necessary in order to achieve success through the desired business outcomes. 
let's step out of the office for a minute. Um, here's a picture of me and a bit of a journey I have been on for two and a half years now. Um, as an adult, I chose to learn how to ride a horse after really never having done it before in my life. Um, I'm in somewhat decent shape, but it's certainly been a journey that's taught me a lot. Um, I will emphasize that unlike workers who have transformations, you know, put placed on their shoulders, I did choose this journey, so that's a big difference. But I, I started thinking about how I had to um, fall, fail, learn, and one of the biggest things I learned was how to communicate. When you sit on a horse, you don't just dangle your legs. You use your legs a lot to tell the horse what to do. When you breathe, the horse can hear you breathe, and he can probably tell if you're up, you know, nervous, upset, tired, stressed, etc. So what I have learned is that at first, uh, when I was a, a very much a newbie, I was excited. I was anticipating all this, you know, this new activity. I was nervous about failing, and I was somewhat just um, uncomfortable because I was using new muscles that I had not used before. But over time, as my confidence and my competence has increased um, with coaching about my body position, I've become a more effective communicator. Um, so my horse and I have been able to graduate to more advanced challenges, doing different gates, bending lines versus straight lines, trotting over poles, jumping over little jumps, and we've become an agile team. I really believe that, and it was something I thought might uh, resonate with people in their own lives when you think about physical challenges or mental hurdles that you've encountered and conquered. Uh, these are the kinds of stories that are useful to weave into solutions when we design starting for coworkers and colleagues, too. It, uh, it makes everything more personal and relevant. So I will say that um, as learning leaders and change leaders, many things we've been applying in the past are still applicable. You don't need to throw, um, throw them all out and start over with a clean sheet of paper, um, especially if you've been practicing putting yourself in your user's chair, in their seat. I think they're still asking these questions. When will I encounter the change? How are the business processes changing? Who will approve this once I've done my part? You know, what are the rules? Uh, where can I go for help? The basic questions, things that they want to know, you're still going to be helping them answer. But um, to kind of compare and contrast, this slide, um, GP Strategies has used for um, some time now to talk about what does success look like. And on the colored part of the slide on the left is kind of more traditional initiatives that you may have supported in the past. At Go Live, during stabilization, and over time, what does success look like? And then on the right, in the black squares, we compare and contrast that with the digital transformation um, success picture. And that's where I'll focus here um, to talk to this slide. Users' transactional needs may be less than they were in the past, but uh, their motivation may be greater. And I have mentioned a couple of times in the last half hour that motivation and engagement increases when people understand what their piece of the process is and stories and scenarios are relevant to them. So the more you can, you know, add relevance, increase their motivation, um, the more you'll encourage successful adoption. During stabilization, so after go live, as you're getting used to the new systems, and it's no longer just playtime, but it's real, real life, I would say the need for you as learning leaders to provide forums for continuous learning are going to be greater than ever. So, polling people, finding out what their, you know, the problems are, what they're getting stuck on, and then establishing ways very quickly to um, address those concerns and needs will be your role. Um, will you want to leverage information you created for pre-go live? Certainly. That's the same story as always. Things, solutions we design and develop 
we want to be leverageable and sustainable. Absolutely. Um, that I think that probably is the biggest common factor between um, our role supporting digital transformation initiatives as it has been in the past, um, especially with the waves of releases coming faster and faster. Whatever you create has to be easily changeable if needed. Um, I would close by saying over time that the need for collaboration um, will continue to be very great. So the more that you can um, use sites for knowledge sharing, for communities of practice, to share ideas, to share fails, to come up with um, you know, better ways of doing things, uh, the more agile your workforce is going to feel. And you will be establishing an agile culture by, by allowing them to participate in those forums. Uh, quickly, as we wind up, um, just going to kind of recap again some things we've been talking about. There is a greater need for more clear uh, and intentional communication at all stages of the game. There are, and that's, that's just a fact. So both for ourselves as leaders and coaches, as well as for our enterprise, I think it's going to be important on both sides of the coin for communication to be um, more relevant and available via multiple channels that people are going to want and need to use. Although there will be less emphasis on transactional documentation, you know, this is a nod to the more intuitive interfaces of our digitally transformed platforms. Um, there, the alternatives are, you know, maybe people don't want to read how to do something step by step. They don't need to go into that detail, but they might want to view a video. So the microlearning videos are certainly um, something that we're using more and more of and, and our customers are um, agreeing are good, um, good solutions. I'll close by saying on this slide that the ownership of a solution becomes, absolutely becomes a critical issue. Um, we've always advocated a need for a sustainment strategy and it's no different now. Um, what we design needs to be maintained, needs to be repurposed, and the folks that are doing that need to have the skills as well as be on the forefront of what the changes are to make those intelligent decisions. Beside microlearning, some of the things that we've been using um, to support enterprises that are going through digitally trans digital transformations include coaching guides. Um, no longer are you preparing PowerPoint decks for large, uh, long duration training classes. Coaching guides are more topical and maybe focused on um, a single process. Likewise, role-based interactive PDF documents visually lay out a process end-to-end -end and then allow different roles to drill down into their part of the process. And we've got samples of these that I may use, um, I may provide links to in the follow-up blog. I wasn't able to do that for this webinar today, but it'd be nice if you'd like to see some of those, I'd be happy to provide them. And finally, survey early, survey during, survey after, survey often. Um, I think at different points on your timeline, you're going to want and need to know how people are feeling. Are there expectations being met? Um, are there gaps so that you can address them efficiently and effectively? These are Undoubtedly, some of the parameters you've had to consider um, in the past when deciding where to apply your time and budget and your other resources. Um, and I would say that they are continue to be important. So keeping business outcomes part of the stories you tell will encourage motivation and engagement and drive adoption. I think that's my bottom line and I hope that what we've been talking about has resonated with you um, today. We're going to close with one more poll question. So the question is, after participating in this webinar today, which solution elements resonate best with your challenges? And I'll explain that although choices C and D here look somewhat the same, um, the way I wrote them is interpreted as follows. C is, I think I'll need some custom elements. I'm using some off-the-shelf content, but I, I think I may need some custom elements to meet our needs. 
Whereas B is, I think our enterprises need dictate a fully customized approach. So that's the difference between C and D. Thanks, Ellen. And we're going to give it about 15 more seconds and then close out the poll and share the results. So go ahead if you haven't had a chance to um, input your answers and we'll share the results shortly. Ellen, do you see those results now? I do. Great. Um, and it looks like nearly half of the audience chose B, seeing the need for additional communication and change management. Um, yes, that's uh, it's good to know. Um, so you're comfortable, perhaps, with your L&D, the, the learning, the training, the, the documentation elements, but communication and change is where you are perhaps wanting to allocate more resources. Well, thank you. That uh, wraps up my session, Kayla, and we can move on to the Q&A portion. Great. Well, thank you, Ellen, for that great discussion. Um, we do have some time left. It looks like um, we anticipated this to be about 45 minutes to an hour long session. So we do have some time for questions. We've had a few come in. Uh, but before we jump into those, I do just um, want to remind everyone, if you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A module at this time. That's in the lower right-hand panel of WebEx. And Ellen covered a lot in the last oh, 30, 45 minutes, and there's still a lot to discuss. So we encourage you to continue the conversation uh, with Ellen beyond today's session. You can see here her contact information is available on the slide deck. And we will send everyone a link to a follow-up blog post where she'll be addressing some of today's key takeaways. And she's also extended a special offer for webinar participants. That's 30 minutes of free consulting if you book by the 31st of May. And so be sure to contact Ellen directly to schedule that. I'd also like to remind everyone that the recording and slides from today's session will be sent to the email address that you provided when you registered. So um, I will go ahead and jump into the questions that are coming in. And the first one is, across the enterprise, who are the audiences who are feeling the impact of digital transformation the most? And there's a second part to this, so hold on one second. What are some best practices to mitigate those impacts? Okay, great. Let's see. Um, if we consider um, either HR or perhaps sourcing, um, I would say the roles impacted the most are middle managers. Um, they have, you know, the middle manager is out in the enterprise. If there's a, you know, digitally transformed HR or sourcing um, initiative going on, the middle managers in the enterprise are used to relying on a service team, central HR, central sourcing. And now most responsibilities are pushed out to, to them. And so they may feel like they're being asked to do more. There's more on their plate more approvals to make, more um, requests to initiate. And the gap may be biggest for them because they just they feel there's more that they need to do, both not only for serving their team members, but also reporting upwards. So support them with um, surveying. Find out where their, their biggest concerns and gaps are. And then um, identify ways, both coaching and perhaps for group sessions, and collaboration to help them uh, bridge that gap. Great, thank you. Um, the next person's question is asking to describe how change of learning leaders should help the workforce better anticipate and adapt to um, cloud solution providers quarterly or six months, depending on the, the time of the releases, um, but a cloud solutions update schedule. Okay, um, I think I understand that. Um, so I would say that either the learning leaders or a center of excellence, change champions, whatever you call your, your team, you'll want to do what I, I think I referred to during the session as getting ahead of the curve in order to quantify the changes of the release that's being anticipated. Do you, can you get early previews um, of the solution? Can you get notes from the, um, the platform provider? And once you can quantify those, preview them, you may want to communicate early um, with short videos, uh, maybe a brown bag, let people know what's coming 
and if there are certain roles that are affected more than others, focus your communications on them. Um, I also mentioned that it's important for whatever solution you do create, whatever custom content you write, to make sure that it's easily changeable because if the, if the, if the release changes the look and feel of something, you'll want to be able to swap out any pictures of screens or new um, layout of fields on screens so that it keeps up to date with what people are looking and seeing at the new release. And the next question, um, kind of turning over to data analytics. So are there any new or different data analytic requirements with digital transformation? Are there any new or different analytical requirements? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it probably depends on the solution you're implementing. Um, I think it may have to do with the timeliness of data. You, where you might have had to wait till the end of a month or have a few, few days or the better part of a week to look at something. The fact is we may be asked to look at a volume of data and make a recommendation in a much quicker period of time. And most, most um, solutions, I can say, like for example, SAP Zest for HANA, are going to come with presentation layers. So not only you don't just have a data dump, but you have ways that you can visually see uh, things that are flowing through the organization, you know, ch changes to the quantities of, uh, you know, sales orders that we're booking with customers. Um, you know, size of the sales order or number of sales orders we're bringing in per week, per month by sales rep, that kind of thing. The visual um, ways that that data can be presented actually make it easier to spot trends, to look at outliers and things like that. So I think more emphasis on reading and reviewing the visual presentation of data should be part of um, the training for many roles. I'm talking off the top of my head and I could probably think of more things but that's my first thought. That's, that's great. And, and you know what, those are always things that we can always address in the follow-up blog post. Um, we are coming right up to the you know, 45 minutes after the hour. And so um, what I'll do is, is if there are any other questions, I will leave the uh, webinar open. Go ahead and enter them into the Q&A module at this time. And what we'll do is we'll compile them and I'll send them over to Ellen and we'll make sure that they are incorporated into that follow-up blog post and they'll be emailed to everyone on the call. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again to today's speaker, Ellen Kumar, and thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We do hope that you'll join us again for future webinars and to catch up on the content you missed. You can do this by downloading past recordings or register for upcoming webinars, and all of this is available on our website at gpstrategies.com. I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your week. Thank you.